Welcome to the CES meeting. It's December 21st. Uh, the CES meeting next week will not occur as it, it's bracketed by the holidays. Um, and today I have, would like to have a conversation with Carity about virtual module sources. Carity has expressed in the past that uh, with dissatisfaction with the module virtual virtual module source proposal that there's possible possibly a simpler framing of that. Um, the last time we had a conversation of this form, it resulted in layer zero of the uh, the har module harmonies epic, uh, which was a good outcome. I'm hoping for a good outcome from this conversation too. Um, so, uh, Carrie, do, do you have a concrete idea of which direction you wanted to go? Yes. And what you found dissatisfying about the current direction? So, so, uh, so it's a combination of things. So I was reviewing the proposal, the first proposal, the contour proposal from, from Dave Herman 10 years ago or something like that. And some of the work that we did on the lower side of things as well. Um, and there was always this notion of a very, very low level API that allow you to create an environment record and then set up some values there in such a way that you can control those values um, in the same way that a module export will control them. And by doing so, you, you could articulate any kind of source or equivalent to a source by dramatically creating the environment and setting out the values that you want to export. If we do that, then why will we need to have any sort of abstraction for the different type of sources in the spec? I'll, I'll argue that with that, you can build whatever you want, any kind of um, uh, artifact that produces a module, you could do it in user lab rather than having to provide any kind of abstraction or level of control there or so on. I don't know if that's very different from what you're proposing, but uh, in my mind, is basically the, the the module source is intended to be used for a ECMAScript source, and anything that is not an ECMAScript source should not be a, called a source. It's just that you have a API to create an environment record, and this environment record allow you to control the values that will go into that, and and, and and that's all you need in order to create a module who is bound to that uh, environment record. Uh, for all intents and purposes, that's what a module will be, just uh, giving you a namespace object that corresponds to values that are in that environment record um, and the ability to link to values that are being imported from another module should also be described there. But, uh, I, I'm not sure that is even a requirement. In Dave Herman's proposal, I remember we, at some point, we agreed that uh, trying to, to solve the problem of re-exporting for another module was something that wasn't super important, I would say. That, that was the conclusion there. I don't remember the details. I had to dig, dig out some, some discussions and some comments around that, but that was the general idea in the past. Like it, it allowed you to do a lot more than what we will be able to do if we provide an abstraction that requires a new type of source to be specified either by the host or by the specification. It's just a more generic way of doing it. Okay. So uh, first off, I agree with most of the substance of that. Um, the I uh, or but I would revise it. I would not. Uh, I do not think that a an API an API that allows us to create an entangled pair of module exports namespace and then the and then uh, a namespace object that can be used to govern the assignment of variables into the internal namespace that would be reflected by the external namespace is necessary. I wouldn't call it sufficient. Um, and you hint at one of them as I, I think that 
uh, for one, uh, re-exports do need to be solved. Um, for the the greater version of this proposal, not the lesser version, we don't need re-exports in order to model common JS. Or right. so on the on that one, just to give you more details of what we discussed, is that the API that allows you to control the environment record does not need to have the concept of re-export because that's not how it works in the in the spec. So if, if you have module A that imports something from module B, but module B is exporting that thing from module C, what happens is that in the module A environment record, there will be a binding that will be pointing directly to the value uh, on the on the environment record of the C and B is never in the picture. So when creating never. the binding record, that API is the one that does not need to know or have any sort of concept around the environment, the, the re-exporting aspect of it. Yes, the now, internal namespace object does not need to know about it. The, yeah. the module exports namespace object <laughs> does. And uh, and because the module exports namespace needs to, there the API for constructing an entangled pair of the internal namespace and external namespace would necessarily need to accommodate a way to refer to bindings in other in other exports and uh, in other namespaces. Um, so, so, so to be clear, I agree. The internal namespace object does not need it, but the internal namespace object does need to be entangled with an external namespace. So, whatever API generates that pair needs to account account for the bindings to other namespaces. I didn't quite get that. Then I'm still trying to separate the API yeah. to create a a is a is a is basically a reflective API for environment records. Well, let's 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 get let's get let's get concrete, um, and let's borrow the notion of bindings from the current proposal. That's a an array of objects that represent all of the names that are bound between the, uh, the that are bound in the internal and external uh, namespace of a particular module, right? Like uh, a way to express, uh, I import foo from this and or I export foo as bar from that, but just like the, uh, a way that some means of reflecting what the static dependency graph and namespace and the names that are required to exist on this pair of external of, of exports and internal namespace objects. Um, I'm proposing that your idea is to create a function that accepts a bindings array and returns an exports and a, a, a an external and in, internal namespace object for a particular module. Is that a fair concrete way to express what you're suggesting? No, no, I, I'm, I, no, I'm talking about different things. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very slow today. The, the foundational API that I'm talking about has nothing to do with the module itself. It's an API whose only job is to create an environment record. And in that environment record, allow the creation of bindings whose value must be provided by whoever is creating or has access to the environment record. Okay, so it's like a builder pattern for a namespace object that, is that? Is that, well, not even, that, that one is not even the namespace object. That thing just created an environment record with bindings there, whose only job is basically, it's just a dictionary kind of thing, right? Um, it's it just create an environment record and allow you to create a certain value in that environment record, um, bindings, as we call it, will will be equivalent to a const um, the declaration there, which is what we have today in the in the spec, anyways, for export values. Uh, so you you create a binding there, and that thing is is going to be used by any namespace object who needs to get a value out of that environment record. That's all. 
Then we have to talk about how can we create such namespace object, which I don't know. But the fact that when you create a namespace object, there is an implicit information about where each of the exports from that namespace object points to, which is okay. a lookup on an environment record. One of these environment records can be that environment record that you create manually. That's the original idea from, from Dave, in a sense that you have a very low level mechanism to create something that can be participant of this uh, model graph by virtue of the fact that a name and space object points to an environment record to get a value out. Mm -hmm. That's all. I see. Um, okay. That part is interesting. The thing that it does that the proposal as writ does not is account for the possibility of namespace objects that grow over time. Um, like the, the, the proposal as written in the compartments proposal right now for layer two, um, for virtual module sources does not account for the possibility that the namespace may evolve. Um, and your proposal does. And it, well, and it, uh, well, we haven't talked about the semantics of that, but sure. the way the way we were thinking about this in the past was that I have something that reassembles a, a, a source of a module somehow, whatever the the thing is. You want it to be participant of the module graph, therefore there's a correlation about what that thing, that code that you have on, in some language correspond to. Uh, the actual uh, module. So what you can do in user land, you can do the parsing you know, of whatever language that thing is. Um, you define what the sports are, and you will be able to create. And I specifically mentioned export only, not export from, but export. Uh, and then you will be able to create the environment record, create via reflection and API create objects or some sort of values, ECMAScript values that are valid, that you will place into those uh, different bindings that you will add to the environment record that you just create. And now you have a fully qualifying environment record that can be used by any namespace. And now we're going to the other API, which is, okay, you now have that environment record. It has values on it. It's basically a record. It's just a record that has names of uh, uh, bindings that you will be able to use from somewhere else. And then you go into an API that creates a namespace whose only job is to link to environment record uh, bindings. One of which could be that one that you just create out of the source that you parse. So that's kind of the mechanics of what, what we talked in the past. Uh, and I think that one is very, very low level and allow you to do whatever you want. Uh, if you can produce uh, from some sort of information, you can produce an environment record that has binding, that is all you need to make that participant of the actual um, module graph with the corresponding liveness of the export, because you can at any time change the value of the binding and that will get reflected everywhere as it should be. And okay. As okay, for the okay. question so, of whether it grows or not over time, I believe that is on the name space because when you create a name space, you must validate that the bindings that you're looking for should exist on the actual environment record um, that you are linking to such name space object. Yeah, it can grow over time, but not from that name space. The name space is locked down in terms of what it export because it export from more than one, one or more name uh, environment records. So that's a detail that isn't actually important, I think, for this conversation. What I can say is that I can see such an API being useful for uh, for emulating any language within the system. I can also see such a thing being useful for doing things like REPLs, where there's a where there's a where there's effectively a global where there's a contour that each evaluation is able to augment um, by adding const declarations or let declarations or whatnot. I think that that would be generally useful 
for more than just modules and um, and serves the same purpose as what I was describing for the purposes of building them, uh, building out toward having something like a virtual module source. I'd say that it fulfills a requirement, but it isn't sufficient to implement the whole thing. You need to have, um, for a virtual module source to participate in the module graph, it isn't sufficient to just have a namespace object. You have to also be able to express to the module loader what its dependencies are, um, and uh, and where to link them in and when to link them and then also when to trigger the actual evaluation behavior of the module, which isn't which isn't implied by just having a namespace object. You need to have there needs to be a hook for virtualizing the behavior of examining the dependencies of of a virtual module source, something just like an instance of module source, except that it expresses its bindings by another general mechanism. Um, and then also trigger the evaluation at the right time, right? The import machinery needs to be able to say, you execute now. Here is your here is your contour governor, the thing you're describing. I'll, I'll just call it a contour governor for now. Um, here is your contour governor. Please do your evaluation behavior to populate the values or read from the values that you're linked against at this time. Um, which necessarily happens underneath the stack of the import, the dynamic import uh, kicker, uh, and not at some other user-defined time. Um, so, so in summary, I think you're right that we need to have a lower. I, I think that it's great to have an even lower level API than what I've described for governing the contour. Uh, so, sorry, a few 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 more comments. Because we don't have a reflective API to create a name and space job, I don't think we'll have that. Um, the mechanics that are in place, at least in layer zero, are through a module instance. Um, so you create a module instance, and then that module instance specifies certain things that allow you to create a name and space out of it. Um, so I think that will remain the same. The difference here is that the module instance that you will create um, that will have these um, one or more em environment record associated to it. Um, it, it. It's not coming from a source. And as a result, we might have a different API or a, a different kind of module constructor that allows you to create a, a module who has a very specific details in terms of where is coming, where are the export coming and where are the export from um, resolve and so on. And the kicking process of the, of the um, uh, life cycle of the module itself in terms of when to do certain things. So I, I, I figured that the, the such constructor will, will not be equivalent to the one that we already have um for modules from a source that's why every time that we talk about the virtual source i get kind of a weird feeling about it because i i keep thinking in terms of this is the module not the source the one that you want to control because when you imagine that you can create such module instance that um controls the life cycle so it knows when the import is called on it meaning it needs to be it needs to be ready um you have a hook there that allows you to maybe evaluate some code that fulfills the environment record that you want um uh, ahead of time before anyone can grab a namespace object uh it also describes what this namespace object looks like uh it also describes if that ex the namespace object will be getting uh, bindings from other um, environment record that is not the one that you control. You can create as many as you want, but you, you, you should link every export to an environment record, whether that environment record is a record that you create or a record that someone else create through the normal pathway of creating a, an environment record, which is another module that you're importing from someone else. Uh, so I think that description of what the namespace 
uh, object should look like and what the details of it are should be part of the module constructor rather than considering this part of the source. And I, I understand that when you look at the source, you might get, uh, I'll not say tricked by, by, but it's very, it's very easy to look at the source and saying, oh, the source is the thing, is the one that give me all the details that I need to build such a structure. But I'm looking from the perspective of, well, um, the source might be uh, important for us to create these two things. One is the environment record with the actual values that are relevant to that source and a API that allow me to create a namespace object that contains the metadata about what the source is supposed to be, which might include the usage of this environment record uh, as a storage mechanism for values that the source should produce. So that's kind of the, the way I, I, I'm looking at this. So um, let me highlight some things that I think that we agree upon in order to verify that we agree upon them. I think that we both agree and our proposals are consistent with the fact that namespace objects are not, that there is no, there is no API that would just construct a namespace object. Um, That's correct. Because even, even imagine that you construct that imagine that you want to construct this thing from a source and you want it to have it as a dependency on a module that you create from source. Yes. The API that we have, well, that module that you create from source can only resolve in the import hook to a module instance. It's mm -hmm. not even a name and space, so it would not work if it is a reflective name and space API. Yeah. It has to be a module so you can link it. So to be clear, I think that both of our proposals are consistent with the fact that there's no user ace, that the only entity in 262 that would ever construct a namespace object is the machinery hiding behind dynamic import. That that's consistent. Um, the the discrepancy I think between okay, so let me let me as a straw man let's propose that there is an alternate module constructor. I think that that's equivalent. That is equivalent to what we're proposing, but. I maintain that there is a distinction between the responsibilities of the module source and the module instance that that would not reflect well. Um, and that is that module sources are reusable, right? They and stateless. The, the, a virtual module source doesn't contain an environment record. It, it has a hook. It's more like it's more like our handler object. It's more like a more elaborate handler object on the module for the module constructor, except being placed in the position of the source because it's re because and only because it's reusable. Um, but, is it, but is it serializable? Uh, I don't think it is. So, no, no, it's not. So for, for those reasons, I think the reusability of it um, uh, is on the is on user user line. Basically, the the user the one describing how this thing is reused and it could be that well the the user has a function that can be used to reconstruct one of these um environment records and module um module instances associated to that original source and i think that's philosophically consistent with the existing positions right that module sources are not themselves serializable they have a host defined serialization behavior in the same way virtual module sources have a virtual sort virtual host defined serialization behavior they are not themselves serializable but a virtual host can contrive of a means for serializing them right so I have one question here just to to ask about this because um when when you get the module source for a script versus a module from the same URL so What's are we saying, are we saying here that we um so so let's say you get the the same um URL and it's being invoked as a module 
uh, by being imported uh, and it's being referenced as a script. Um, so I think this this creates two instances of the module source. I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm just wondering if that's if that's what we're saying here, uh, because to my understanding, the the module source um, differs in how you bind, how the bindings go before um, it becomes an instance. They, so to be clear, um, that is not the extent of the differences. <laughs> uh, that modules, module sources, module text, the text of a module is a different grammar production and has different semantics and is implicitly strict mode. It's very different than evaluating a, a, a script. So, so to clarify what you mean here by module source, you mean the the um, not not the fully parsed source, but the parsable source. Uh, I'm going to refer to the text of a module as a module text and okay. a module source as the compiled, not the compiled, okay. the, the, a, a, an object representing the parse of a module text. And a virtual module source is a protocol for emulating that behavior for non-JavaScript modules. Okay, that, that, that's clear. Thank you. Okay, I, I have to drop up on our, our meeting coming up, but but yeah, um, I'm a, I'll be out for a couple of weeks. So I'll, I'll try to maybe draft something to see if we can debate it um, more concretely on the API side of thing, and then um, then we can readjust from there. See. If, if that new direction is worth it to explore or, or if we should stick to what we have right now. Yeah, so I'm convinced that the new direction is worth exploring um, and might even w <laughs> further <laughs> further dig into the fact that numbering the layers of the of the compartment proposal was a mistake from the beginning. We're going to have to resort to and do a decimal system, I think. <laughs> 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 oh, but it sounds to me like modules layer two is effectively going to grow another layer um, in order to accommodate uh, this lower level API that that accounts for the very specific case of binding uh, um, by, uh, of governing a contour object, which I think is which has other uses too. I'm excited. I look forward. Do we, ha do we have distinct um, short names for the layers? We're, yeah, we do. Um, layer zero is uh, module and module source constructor. Module one is reflective bindings, module, re module module binding reflection. Layer two is virtual module source, and it may decompose into at most at like at, at as many as three layers so far within it. There's the contour governor, which is what Carity is discussing, um, and then. Uh, uh, what I like to refer to as virtual module source, the lesser versus the greater, um, the lesser being um, sufficient for non-JavaScript modules and the greater being sufficient for emulating JavaScript. Um, uh, and uh, and then evaluators is the next layer, then compartments is the layer after that. Okay, I suggest that- um, we Just don't uh, use we, numbers anymore. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, good, good call. Let's do that. It's a graph anyway. <laughs> the numbers were useful for for uh, uh, for communicating that there was a layering to them that they, but it was uh, it's a, it imposes a total order where none such exists. Right. It was rhetorically, it was a great thing to start with, but but I think we've gotten past that exactly. Yeah, it's, it's no longer useful. <laughs> All right. It looks like. Uh, it looks like that's a meeting for us. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks.